lecture series. Uh, the topic tonight is the global migration crisis and its impact in Europe. As many of you may know, uh, the world community faces an unprecedented global migration crisis with an estimated more than 60 million persons displaced by conflict, extreme poverty, uh, social upheaval, and environmental degradation. Uh, many of these displaced persons are in, in, an, in and around the Syria and Iraq region, uh, but many more have come from North America, excuse me, uh, Africa, uh, South America, Central America, seeking refuge in safe harbor countries such as the European Union member countries and the United States. Uh, this evening we have Professor Linda Tobin sociology professor here at ACC who's going to bring us up to speed and help us understand the migration crisis as it impacts Europe. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I, I, think I can just go because you just essentially said it. Um, I want to welcome all of you here. I'm, I'm really uh, glad that you were able to make it and uh, you were able to get through that traffic out there. It doesn't matter where we are in Austin. Uh, traffic is really bad at this time of the day. Uh, I Just to give you a little bit of my background, because I know some of you might be wondering why is this person standing here talking about this issue. Um, I am a professor of sociology here at ACC, and I have developed an interest in uh, population displacement issues over a period of uh, quite a few years. And I think that my interest in the displacement of population probably began um, during... <laughs> during the uh, Clinton administration because I had a, I have a brother-in-law who was served as ambassador to a couple of African countries during that period of time. And one of those countries was Burundi. And so I would hear him talk about uh, what was going on in Burundi during that period of time. And since that period of time, I've, you know, I've continued to read. And it wasn't until uh, ACC was uh, I was fortunate enough to get a, to receive a sabbatical from ACC in 2009-2010 um, and I was able to spend time in a refugee setting. So I traveled to Africa and spent uh, close to a couple of months in a refugee settlement in Zambia and then a couple of years later I traveled to Uganda, spent time among uh, urban refugees and then last summer I traveled to the Middle East and went to Lebanon, um, went to Jordan, and went to the West Bank, uh, as well as Israel, uh, and spent some time among refugees in those places. So the reason why I've wanted to travel uh, is because I can read and read and read and I can listen and I can see on TV or on the news these issues about refugees, but actually I think going where some of them have been displaced and where some of them are trying to uh, make, their, make their lives or at least uh, wait their time until they might be able to return home, I think that's been invaluable. So that's a little bit about me and that's why I'm here tonight talking about uh, these particular issues. Uh, as William said, according to the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency, there are well over 60 million displaced people around the globe. And this is an unprecedented number. We've not seen numbers uh, quite to this extent. I wrote down that according to the refugee agency, on average, 24 people were forced to flee uh, every minute in 2015. And that's, you know, when you think about that, 24 people forced to flee their homes every minute in 2015, that's an astounding figure to think about. So here we are, we're talking about, um, I'm going to talk about uh, this crisis that exists in uh, Europe because of the migration uh, in, in the year 2015, and then to a lesser extent, what's happening this year as well. And I think one of the first questions I want to ask is, why is this called a crisis? For whom is it a crisis? Is it a crisis for those European nations that are dealing with this mass influx uh, of uh, arrivals? Uh, is it, you know, when we think about mass migration, it's certainly not a novelty. Is it a crisis for European uh, 
leaders who have to think about their own political future and maybe their own political future uh, as it relates to a growing, um, I guess, occurrence of populism or nationalism. And, and, you know, that's when I thought about crisis, I thought, how, you know, how am I going to treat this word crisis? Uh, is it a crisis, do you think, because there might be a, an unwillingness of nations to act together uh, to, you know, in, the, in, in human interests? Uh, you know, what's really going on? Why, why do we have a crisis? Or uh, is the crisis that we see in the European Union, is that crisis any more dire than what we've seen in countries like Jordan? Or countries like Lebanon, or countries like Turkey. Uh, Turkey, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, hosts more refugees than any other nation in the world. They uh, are said to be hosting two and a half million refugees. Uh, or is it a crisis for the refugees themselves? Is it, a, is it a crisis indeed for those people who have been forced to flee for one reason or another undergoing a very daunting journey to reach safe haven. So those are the, you know, those are the kinds of, of, of issues that I think about when I think about the term crisis. In 2015, we know that according to statistics from the International Organization of Migration and the UN uh, Refugee Agency, over one million arrivals came to the shores of uh, Europe. I've seen statistics, you know, if you do any research, you always see a, a kind of a variance in stats, but the statistics uh, indicate that there were, any more from, there were anywhere from one to 1 1.2 million arrivals on the shores of uh, mostly Greece, to a lesser extent, Italy, and, and, and even to a lesser extent, in, at times hungry. I'll get into that later on. But these uh, are people who risked their lives, the lives of their families, uh, to board, uh, to go aboard uh, really pretty much overcrowded, unseaworthy uh, vessels to take them uh, where they hoped would be safe haven. And, uh, I wanted to, I have a couple of slides here. I could have brought a hundred thousand slides, but I, I only have five. So, <laughs> so um, this first slide here in a moment is a slide that is pretty sobering, uh, and I'm not sure whether it was taken from a helicopter or from a, from a drone, but uh, you can see that this is a boat that is maybe seaworthy, but it looks like it's pretty overcrowded. <laughs> Uh, uh, at least to be, and it, you can see that there are people of you know many different many different faces. It doesn't look to me like any of them have on life jackets, uh, and so they are making this voyage somewhere to Europe. And then this slide right here, you can see they have reached uh, some land, and they're 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 passing off uh, people and children and babies and people are on the shore reaching for them and, and, and helping them to get ashore. So, so uh, I wanted to give you a quote from the poet Warsaw Shire who observed, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. You know, why would you do that? It would take, it takes a tremendous leap of faith uh, to put your trust in what is hopefully a brighter future and, uh, and, and risk everything to, to make this voyage. Of the arrivals in Europe in 2015, over 50% of them were from Syria, 20% uh, of them were from Afghanistan, and uh, a little, about 8% were from Iraq. And by the way, the Afghans largely were probably not going to to be able to obtain asylum, and I'm going to talk about that later on. So, while we're talking about 
a million people, which seems like a heck of a lot, seems like a lot to me. Uh, these, this one million, or 1.2 million, they were, they were headed toward the European Union, which has a population of 508 million. So this one million represents only two tenths of a percent uh, of the 508 million that are there in the European Union. And so rather than thinking about it in terms of two tenths of a percent, it was just the idea that there were hundreds of thousands of people coming from distant shores, so to speak, uh, entering the European continent. And that was quite alarming. It created a lot of anxiety, it got a lot of attention, and this issue of immigration, this issue of migration, we know was probably uh, one of the big reasons why we saw the vote that we saw last week in the United Kingdom. Although what's kind of ironic about that is if you, leading, leading up to that vote, the Brexit vote, leading up to that, if you looked at the, the if you looked at the people that were in favor of the UK leaving the EU, they would not infrequently appear before posters that were not necessarily uh, uh, other European Union members who were migrating to England, but they looked like refugee faces. And it was very controversial. And they are the ones that were not immigrating, have not immigrated in any great numbers to, to England, to the UK. And I'll talk about, again, I'll come back to that later on. So what exactly is migration? Because I wanted to address that too. Uh, we, I'm throwing the word around immigration, migration. It is one of the three population processes, and it is the most difficult population process to measure. There's no one definition for uh, migration. Uh, you can look up the term and you can see a lot of different definitions for migration. In Europe, they typically consider anyone uh, a migrant or someone who has migrated if they intend to stay for a period of 12 months or longer. So that's how they are looking at this issue of just migration. And one of the reasons why population or migration is a difficult process to measure is because it can be accomplished in a lot of different ways. So sometimes when people migrate, they do it, if, you know, if they're living in point A and they want to get to point Z, they do, they make this move in one fell swoop. It's like big voyage, I'm there, this is where I intend to stay or this is my destination. But many people don't migrate that way. Sometimes they go from point A to point F and then they stay for a while. And then sometimes they move on and they'll go to point M and then they stay there for a while. And point Z is always their final destination, so to speak. So it is difficult to measure because people don't always inform the authorities when they are leaving. And sometimes we don't always know when they have arrived either. And so that makes it more difficult. The kind of migration that has been described as part of this crisis uh, is what we call a mixed flow. And it is a mixed flow migration because we know that when we see these scenes, some of these individuals will fit the definition of refugee and some of these individuals will not. They are migrant workers. Sometimes they're referred to as economic migrants, but there are many people who don't like the term economic migrant. You know, when you, when you do research and you do a lot of reading on these issues, you always find something objectionable about a term, so you're, I try to use these terms interchangeably. But it's a mixed flow migration. And other people will also refer to it as an irregular migration. It's irregular because it entails people coming into nations without their permission. So these people are not seeking permission. For one reason or another, they're arriving. And what we know about asylum, if you are seeking asylum in this context, you have to be there in person before you can apply for asylum and possibly receive it. You can't do it from afar and then 
based on what the decision that they make, you, you end up coming. When we think about the reasons why people choose to migrate, those of you that are familiar with migration knows that, know that there is a theory out there called push-pull, and it's pretty easy. In times of stability, in times of normalcy, when, you know, when, when nothing is untoward is going on in our lives, we might think about migrating. Why would any of us in here think about moving somewhere else? Well, it could be because we want a better job. It could be because we want to join family members who live somewhere else in the world or in California or wherever it might be. It might be because we're going to retire and we just want to go to a different location. In times of stability and normalcy, people are pulled. We are being pulled toward a destination. We find it attractive. But when things are not normal, when times are not normal, when we see wars, when we see famines, when we see you know, political unrest, whatever it might be, a lack of opportunity, uh, we see people pushed. People are pushed out. And during these periods of times, the push is always going to be stronger than the pull. They're, they're literally being pushed out. And then, of course, pull can come into play later on. So sometimes you see a mixture of both. Of the one plus million arrivals to Europe in 2015, 885,000 of them uh, entered through Greece, passing uh, a very pretty narrow uh, body uh, passageway between the Turkish mainland and the Greek islands. This is referred to as the Eastern Mediterranean Corridor. Um, 885,000 people arriving in Greece is a tremendous number of people. It's a tremendous number of people arriving in any one country, even in a country that might be equipped to handle such a population flow. But at the same time, while we know that a million or or, or so arrived safely, the International Organization of Migration suggests that as many as 4,000 people didn't make that voyage safely. They drowned. And I would be willing to bet that there were probably more than 4,000 people that lost their lives last year trying to make that, that trip. The distance from the Turkish mainland to some of the Greek islands, Greece, Greece has a lot of islands, uh, in some instances is only a couple miles, uh, Lesbos, that island, is, was a very popular island uh, to receive uh, refugees and uh, migrant workers. And that distance is about 18 miles. And uh, doesn't seem like a long distance, but for those of us that have ever spent any time on the water in a boat, we know that 18 miles uh, can be, you know, a long 18 miles, especially when you think about that first slide where it's so terribly overcrowded and, and, and they didn't have life jackets. So before we look specifically at these issues of um, migration and asylum, I want to look at a couple of basic structural elements that are in play that played a really important role in what happened, what will continue to happen in the future. But these are, you know, uh, socio-political, uh, uh, geopolitical kinds of situations uh, that exist in uh, the uh, 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 continent today. When I refer to uh, Europe, I'm going to be referring to what's re uh, called the European Union. So pull that up. No, that's the Schengen. Well, I mean, it's the European Union, but okay. So this is a map of the European Union. It's been in the news a lot lately. Uh, I've learned a lot about the European Union uh, over the last few weeks, uh, and it's 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 a pretty you know it's a pretty interesting concept. The foundation for the uh, European Union, as we now know it, was started after World War II. Uh, in 1958, uh, it uh, had really six founding nation members, founding members, six different nations: Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. And it wasn't until 1993 that we really started referring to it as the European Union, where it really took shape and took form. 
And what it is, is it's an economic and political union. It's an economic and political federation. It operates a single market under which there is free flow of people, capital, goods, and services. And that is, you know, that is uh, uh, paramount to the existence of the European Union. The Union plays a critical role when we think about these issues of migration and asylum because even though we know that there is common policies in some areas within the European Union, we also know that these are these are independent nations, and they have their own self-interests and their own political realities that they're trying to deal with. And I think that's what makes it so interesting, because, because while they are independently sovereign nations, they're still part of a union. And the European Union has what's called a common European asylum system. The expectation is the policies of the common European uh, asylum system will be applied in the same way uh, across all 28 member nations. And we know that that is not the way uh, it, it's happened. The EU has a lot of competency on migration and asylum, but they have really uh, struggled to address these issues that we've seen increasingly uh, there and you know, building up to, you know, culminating last year in 2015. In addition to the European Union, I also want to talk about the Schengen, uh, because that plays a role as well. So, uh, you disregard the differences in purple or lavender or lilac there. They've done that just to delineate different nations. But the Schengen zone is a very interesting uh, structural component of this as well. It's, it was implemented in 1995. There are a lot of people that feel like the Schengen zone is probably one of the greatest achievements of the European Union. It's an area without internal borders. It is an area without internal borders. And so what that means is those countries, these countries that have uh, the external borders, they are responsible for overseeing border control. They are the gatekeepers, so to speak. Okay. You can see, looking at this map, that there, there are 26 members in the Schengen. Not all members of the Schengen belong to the European Union, and not all members of the European Union belong to the Schengen. So it gets really confusing when you're trying to, to keep these straight and do, do a little research. Uh, but they, in, in theory, what happens is you enter, uh, I'll give you a personal example. Last January I went to France, but I didn't just arrive in Paris. I first landed in Iceland. So there's Iceland up there, uh, which is a member of the Schengen, but it's not a member of the European Union. It was in Iceland that I presented my passport. It gets stamped. I then flew to Amsterdam. I walked right in. I didn't have to show anything. And then, later on, as time passed, using public transportation, I traveled through Belgium and into France. And I had no idea what nation I was in until I saw signs that indicated uh, we're in France, because those signs are in French. So it is a free flow of people. Uh, once you're admitted in the Schengen, you can move from nation to nation without border controls in place. But I say that guardedly, with some reservation, because we know that there have been some temporary border controls uh, reinstated uh, among these uh, Schengen members, much to the dismay, I think, of the European Union as a whole. Because that is, you know, that is like a, a, a key uh, component of the European Union, this Schengen zone that exists. So what happens is these border control responsibilities uh, really rest on the shoulders of people of, of, the, of the people of these countries that have these long extended external borders. Uh, and I just got through saying 
how many people arrived in Greece? 885,000 people arrived in Greece, which put a tremendous, here's Greece, right down here. Here's Turkey. So they, they, they landed on these Greek islands and then, they, and then they, they made their way to the mainland from there, usually uh, using a ferry. Um, we've seen, therefore, in this flow of migrants and refugees, we've seen a disproportionate burden placed on the countries of Greece and, to a lesser extent, Italy, because that's where most of this traffic is coming from uh, in this current uh, situation. So today what I, what, you know, what I want to kind of think about, and I'm, I try and think about these different issues and how to put this together, is there are, three, there are three questions that we need to answer. One is, who is entitled to protection? Because that's key. Secondly, what should that protection entail? What does that protection look like? And then thirdly, where should that protection be received? So those are the three, you know, those are three key questions that um, I, 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 want, I want to try and answer. And it's not always easy to answer. Yes? What's the meaning of the three grades of purple? The what? The three grades of purple. They, they did that to delineate the, the boundaries of the individual countries. They're, that's the only reason why they did that. They all mean this. It means the same thing, but we can see that that's France and that's Germany. And, right. Okay. Um, so I've been throwing a lot of terms that ro around out here, and you know I've talked about you know I've used the word refugee, I've used the word migrant worker, or economic worker, uh, or economic migrant. I've used the term I think asylum seeker. What is meant by those terms? You know why does it even matter that we make a distinction between those terms? Well, it matters a great deal for anybody who's seeking asylum, because the international laws address these two groups of people, refugees and migrant workers, quite differently. And it has huge repercussions or implications for their future. So whether we agree with it or not, that, that is the way it is. We, you know, we make a distinction. This group consists of refugees. This group consists of migrant workers. They're not the same, they're not the, it's not the same status and they are seeking asylum for different reasons, uh, and one group will be granted asylum, and one group will probably not be granted asylum, even though we may disagree with that. Okay. So uh, uh, an asylum seeker, just to set that aside, it is an individual who is seeking international protection, but that international protection has not yet been declared or has not yet been decided. You heard me say earlier that you have to be on the shore. You have, to, you have to be there in person to apply for asylum. You can't do it from afar. So, um, so that, that's just the definition of the asylum seeker. Let's look at uh, refugees first. Uh, how was this term, how did this term come into being? What is the history behind it? I'll give you the history very quickly. After World War II, the United Nations recognized that there were hundreds of thousands of people who had dis been displaced from the war. Uh, some of these people had been displaced within their countries. Some of these people, many of these people were no longer in their countries of nationality. Some of these people maybe no longer had a country or were about to lose their country. Uh, uh, they were going to become stateless. And there was this recognition that their situation had to be addressed. And so what the United Nations did was it convened the 1951 Refugee Convention. And the 1951 Refugee Convention, its intent was to address the issues of the displaced population that was found throughout Europe after the war. So that was in 1951. Um, it, in addition to this, it also created the UN Refugee Agency that we refer to as the UNHCR. The UNHCR is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And the United Nations High Commission for Refugees 
was created with a mandate to identify the statuses of displaced populations, protect and support those populations, and try to find durable, long-lasting solutions to their displacement. So the UNHCR, still in existence today, uh, is responsible for the support and protection of all refugees found around the world with the exception of Palestinian refugees. Palestinian refugees fall under the protection of a different UN organization, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. There are estimated about 5 million Palestinian refugees. The UNHCR deals with the 16 plus million uh, refugees that are estimated, you know, in setting aside displaced populations and statelessness and all that. So the UNHCR has been in existence since 1951, uh, since the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention. So the 1951 Refugee Convention is the key legal document, it is still the key legal document, that exists to protect the rights of refugees stipulates the kind of protection that refugee is entitled to. It is the key legal document, this 1951 Refugee Convention. And initially, it was designed only to deal with uh, uh, the European displaced population, but in 1967, I think it was, I think it was 67, 67, uh, or 57, the protocol, 67, yeah. <laughs> I didn't write that down. Uh, so in 1967, there was a protocol of this which encompassed the entire globe. You know, there were there were there were more there was more displacement going on than just in Europe. It was it was it was a global phenomenon. So who's a refugee? How do we define a refugee? What is the definition of refugee? A refugee is someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political affiliation, membership in a particular social group, is outside the country of his nationality, and owing to such fear, <coughs> is unable to or unwilling to avail himself of the protection of his country. That's what makes a, a person a refugee. Fear of persecution. Fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political party affiliation, membership in a particular social group. And they have crossed a political boundary. They are no longer within the confines of their country's borders. They have fled out of fear. And because of that fear that they have, they are unwilling or unable to ask for assistance from their government. So sometimes, I'm really sensitive about this term refugee because lots of times I see the word refugee being used, misused or used in the wrong way. Uh, I remember after Hurricane Katrina, for example, uh, people, the media started calling uh, the evacuees from New Orleans <coughs> refugees, and it was like, no, 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 they're not refugees. It's a displaced population, but they're, guess what? They're still in America, and guess what? <laughs> Our government is still responsible for them. They still seek the protection of our government. Notice in the definition of refugee, there is no mention of victims of war. It doesn't say that anywhere. These are people that are victims of war. It just says fear of persecution. The cornerstone of the, 91, of the 1951 Refugee Convention is the concept of non-refoulement or non-refoulement. This is the cornerstone of this 1951 Refugee Convention. And what it says is this. No refugee can be forcibly returned back to their country of nationality if they indeed will suffer uh, harm to themselves physically 
or if they are going to experience a loss of freedom. And what, this, is, this is an international humanitarian law. Uh, all nations really are expected to abide by this. And it doesn't matter whether a nation is a signatory to the 51 convention or its, and or its protocol. It doesn't matter whether you've signed off on that or not. There is this understanding that just in terms of international humanitarian law, you do not force people back home uh, if they still f have a fear of persecution for whatever reason it is. That, that is that's, the, that's the cornerstone. And, and, and yet, we know that it can happen. And it does happen. Refoulement or refoulement does happen. That refers to forced return. And so I was going to just tell you a very brief example of, uh, of when I, uh, I knew it to happen. It involved with, uh, just right before I went to Zambia. So it was in 2010. I went to Zambia in February, I believe. And right before I went, about three weeks before I went, I just happened to spot a little article, I think in the newspaper, about some unrest that had been going on in Mahaba refugee settlement. And it's like, oh, wow, let me look at this. What's going on? Well, unrest, unrest that resulted in the death of a female refugee from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so I delved into this. It's like, okay, let me see what's going on. Maybe I don't really want to go there. Uh, the Congolese refugees in Mahaba, there in Zambia, were they were upset about some issue. And I don't remember what the issue was. But a group of, I want to say it was around 150 to 200 people, they left their homes and they temporarily camped out, so to speak, either on the grounds of the compound of the UNHCR. So the UNHCR has a presence in the, in the settlement. It has, it's like a compound within, it's fenced off. They either temporarily occupied that ground or they were right outside the gates and they were there for a for uh, oh, oh, I don't know how long they were there but they were told over and over this is not going to solve anything you need to go back please please leave please disperse and they refused to do so and so Zambia was upset with them and they said enough of this and they called in the military and the military forced them at gunpoint to disperse and go back to their homes but in doing so uh, a woman was, was shot and killed. So they dispersed. They, they, they went back to their, their houses. But Zambia wanted to make a point. And what they did was they rounded up the ringleaders. I think there were about six guys uh, that they identified as being behind this whole unrest. And then later on, they got their hands on another 30, and they forced them back to the Democratic Republic of Congo. They put them on a bus, they transported them there, and they dropped them off. Well, the UNHCR was really upset. They said, you can't do this. You can't force these, these individuals back. It's unsafe there. There's a lot of unrest. Zambia promised that they had dropped them off in a safe zone. I have no idea. And when I saw that, I thought, this is an example, this is an example of forced return. This is refoulement, refoulement. Uh, and so it does happen, even though it is the cornerstone of the 1951 convention, it does happen. Uh, they weren't finished, by the way, just to add one more thing. They weren't finished with those who had protested. They identified the remaining people who had done nothing more than just sit and make their presence known. They rounded them up and they put them on a bus and they told them that, well, it seems to us, you do not feel Mahaba is a really great place to live. So let's see how you like living in the next refugee settlement, which was further west. Its name was Mayukwayukwa. And they sent them to Mayukwayukwa. And I heard, though I never went there, I heard that it was, it was pretty bad. So. That's, that's an example, example of refoulement or refoulement. So refugees have the right to request and receive asylum in safe countries, but they have other rights. And I just wanted to read off a few of the other rights according to the convention that refugees have. 
Uh, they have the right to work, the right to housing, the right to education, uh, the right to assistance, the right to freedom of religion, the right to access the courts, the right to freedom of movement, uh, the right to be issued identity and travel documents. And again, these are ideals. This is not necessarily the reality, and I don't want you to think, you know, we're here tonight to talk about Europe, and here I am, I'm talking about places that are non-European. But it's possible that some of these rights that are accorded to refugees may not be observed in all of these countries that these refugees end up, these asylum seekers end up uh, being hosted in. They may not have all of those rights. It's going to depend on where they are. Um, when I was in Mahaba, and this was in 2010, the refugees had no identity documents. None. And Mahaba has been in existence since 1971. So they've been there for a long time with no identity documents. And you, we all know, we know how important an identity document is, right? We know that we, we better have our driver's license on us or if we're asked for it, or some form of ID. And it's no different anywhere else. The right to work. The right to work is another right that can be overlooked. Um, there are significant restrictions placed on refugees' right to work. For example, in Lebanon, Lebanon hosts uh, close to a million Syrian refugees. It's estimated they, they host close to a million Syrian refugees. Um, Syrian refugees in, in Lebanon cannot work in the formal labor market. So working for a business, working anywhere where it's recognized as a formal labor market uh, endeavor, they, can, they are prevented from doing so. Of course, sometimes they do it illegally. So therefore, most of them work in the informal labor market. We see refugees engaged in this a lot. Or they form their own small businesses. It's estimated that 70% of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon are living in poverty. It's not a surprise to me. It's not a surprise to me. And, and, and in terms of the right to housing, one more, one more um, thing I just, or example I wanted to give comes from my visit to Lebanon last year. So when I went to Lebanon, I spent, well, it was less than a week uh, in Shatila, a uh, Palestinian uh, refugee camp in the southern part of Beirut. So when I say the word Palestine, you know, camp, everybody kind of conjures up an idea of maybe tents and, you know, UNHCR on the side and it's not kind of set apart from, you know, the city or whatever. And this is part of the city. This is, an, this is a neighborhood within the city. It's existed for close to 60 years. And it houses primarily Palestinian refugees. But Syrian refugees have moved in as well. And uh, their infrastructure is very poor there. The water that comes out of the tap water is untreated. It's extraordinarily salty. Uh, plumbing you know, is an issue. The lights are on and off. And, so, and this is where many, many people live. Thousands of people live there. And so when I would travel around, I was always accompanied by a Palestinian refugee. She was my, she was my guide. And one of the reasons why I always traveled with her was, first of all, I don't speak Arabic. And secondly, it was real easy to get lost there because all the building, it was, I just, it was hard. It was twists and turns, narrow passageways. And so she and I were headed somewhere, and uh, I don't remember where, and it was, and, and the buildings were becoming increasingly closer together. So the, near, the passageway was narrowing, and it, so it was therefore getting darker in the passageway. And there was water that was flowing down this passageway, so I was kind of watching where I was stepping, and um, she was telling me about the Syrian refugees that had moved in, and there were just not very many places for them to, to live at all. So she kind of offhandedly pointed to a couple of open doors right in this passageway that we were walking in, down, and the doors were open. And uh, she said, we have some Syrian refugees living, living there. And uh, I'm always really careful about how I interact with people around the world anyway. I'm always mindful of, you know, and respectful of, of, or try to be of their privacy and, 
and I, you know, I don't want to go around me taking pictures and all of that. But I did glance, you know, I glanced in. And the very first word that came to my mind was the word dungeon. These were very, very dark and dank places. The water was trying to get in to this, into these rooms. And the next thought that I had immediately was no human being should ever live in a place like this for any length of time. And while it's true, they were no longer fearing the dropping of barrel bombs. This was where they were housed temporarily. And I, I just kept on walking and, and reflecting on what I had seen. I wanted to give you a quote from uh, an individual uh, by the name of Zygmunt Bauman. He's an emeritus professor of sociology at the University of Leeds in Britain. And I thought what he, uh, what he said is, you know, so, is powerful. He says, refugees end up all too often cast in the role of a threat to the human rights of established native populations instead of being defined and treated as a vulnerable part of humanity in search of the restoration of, these, of those same rights of which they have been violently robbed. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think it is powerful and that's, that's, that's typically uh, how, some how they are perceived in, uh, at least among some people. Okay, so refugees, migrants. So what is a migrant? Because I said I wanted to make a distinction. A migrant worker or an economic migrant in comparison to a refugee leaves his or her country for a lot of reasons, but it's not because of a fear of persecution. So that, you know, that is a key difference. They leave for greater opportunities. They leave because they want to better their lives. They leave because perhaps there aren't any opportunities at home. Uh, they want to they, they want to study, they want to reunify with their family or reunite with their family, but their departures are not related to uh, persecution. They continue to enjoy the protection of their government, even though they're in a different location. Uh, uh, but the key point here is they don't have the same rights to asylum as do refugees. They do not have the same rights to asylum as do refugees. Even though we understand that the search for a better life is probably a basic human right, uh, there is this distinction made. So we have this mixed flow that's been coming, that was coming to Europe. And we continue to see the mixed flow even today. I think it's really important for us to um, stop and, and, and think about this situation because as I said a minute ago, this is not the same. Seeking asylum in the European Union is not quite the same as seeking asylum on the doorsteps of the United States of America. We are not part of a union. So we, we, we have our own, well, I don't need to be careful here, but we have our own vested interests at heart. And so we are self-determining, you know, we are we act autonomously. I, you know, I know that's an exaggeration. It's a vast overgeneralization. But you understand, we have our own asylum policy, and so that's the rule. Those are the rules to which we adhere or which we follow. But when we're talking about seeking asylum in the European Union, we're talking about landing uh, maybe in Greece or maybe in Italy, and they're part of a union, and so they might want to act in their own self-interest, and it appears that sometimes they have done so, but in reality, they're supposed to follow this common European asylum system, uh, and uh, there's, what we get is a patchwork of uneven results, and that's, that's really what we've seen. And so that creates a lot of anxiety among the members of the European Union, and, and it, gets, it garners a lot of attention. So once asylum seekers reach the uh, European uh, continent, uh, they are expected to report to a reception center. They're supposed to do this in a timely manner. Now, I, I, don't, I don't really know what timeliness is because I saw different, different figures given, but the sooner the better. The expectation is they're going to make their way to either a police station or a reception center 
and they're going to be, they're, the information is going to be taken, they may be photographed, they're definitely going to be fingerprinted, and their fingerprints should be placed in the, Euro, it's called EuroDAC, it's a fingerprint database. Uh, however, throughout most of 2015, having arrived usually in Greece after this long, dangerous trip, a lot of these migrants and refugees, because remember, we don't know what they are, we know that it's a mixed flow. They were simply being waved through. They were simply being waved through. Why? Because over 800,000 people were arriving in a country that was ill-equipped to handle this flow of people that we saw in 2015. Greece was the gatekeeper. Greece was the one that had the long exposed external border. And in theory, Greece should have been processing each and every one of these uh, arrivals. That's not what was happening. Greek government didn't have the resources to deal with the flow. The Greek politicians didn't have the political will to make sure that reception centers were staffed the way they should have been. Uh, we all know that Greece has been in the news over the last number of years. <laughs> You know, they have their own uh, political issues and their own economic issues. Uh, and they started blaming the European Union for not providing more funding to them uh, to make sure that these arrivals could be processed, uh, which is understandable given their limited resources and the fact that they were just overwhelmed with the number of uh, migrants and refugees that were landing. So for months, um, most of the new arrivals were neither registered nor fingerprinted due to these severe staff shortages. Uh, and increasingly, the police, the police were responsible for managing these reception centers on the islands because they could no longer even provide food for these arrivals. They literally <laughs> opened the gates and ferries were continued to be uh, brought to the Greek islands, to Lesbos, for example. Refugees and migrants boarded these ferries. They went to Athens. It's probably a trip of, it's, uh, I don't know, I want to say maybe it's five hours, a five-hour ferry trip from Lesbos to Athens. Uh, and then they were, they boarded buses to be taken to train stations, and the expectation was they were going to exit Greece. They were, they were out because Greece didn't, could not assume responsibility for them. Um, my son was, happened to be volunteering in Lesbos uh, the end of, July, uh, the end of uh, January up until about the first week of March. He was volunteering with an agency that was working with the uh, Norwegian Refugee Council. And he, he, so he worked in one of the camps, the camp called Moriah. And uh, he and I had a lot of conversations about what was going on and uh, the chaos that would, well, I won't call it chaos, uh, although he did say it was some, sometimes chaotic, where there would be nothing going on, nothing going on. And then he said, as if out of nowhere, a boat would materialize uh, on the water. And so uh, they would, if they hadn't been, um, uh, what's the word? I don't want to use the word apprehended, but if, 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 if a ship had not met them and they were able to make their way to land, he said then they would be helped ashore and a lot of them were wet and they needed to get clothing and uh, you know, medical attention if they needed medical attention. But he said that a lot of them over time, they really, they wanted to get the heck out of Greece and a lot of them wanted to go to a little Greek village on the border with Macedonia called Idomini. Idomini, and uh, Idomini has been in Idomini has been in the news quite a bit lately because that's where that's where they've been stopped because the border's now closed. So we have this kind of untenable situation uh, with some unrest that's existed. Uh, really, it's kind of it's to some extent it's still ongoing. Um, and he said that they would they would tell them you really you know they would devise against it they. They would offer advice and they were asked, what have you heard, what have you heard, what have you heard? Are the borders open, are the borders open? And they would give them the information that they had uh, on the island of Lesbos. 
but he said that he said that they were so they were so intent upon making their way out of Greece that it didn't matter what they were being told. They were going, they just needed to get one step closer to their desired destination. And where was their desired destination? Well, for many of them, it's, it was Germany. And so many of these arrivals were seeking asylum in countries like Germany, like Sweden, um, uh, like Austria, like Norway, uh, where they felt they had a much better chance of receiving asylum. Uh, these are countries that have uh, liberal social benefits. They were, we, all, we know that Germany was very welcoming and all embracing, at least up to a point, uh, uh, of the arrivals. Germany received, of, the, of all the asylum applications that were filed uh, last year, Germany received over 400,000 of them. That's a lot. That's a lot. And so they wanted to make their way to a country where they felt they had better, they had better odds of actually receiving asylum. Why would you want to stay in Greece that has a 25% unemployment rate, really restrictive citizenship and residency laws, and they're really not well equipped to deal with an influx of, pop, of additional population anyway. The other thing to keep in mind is this. These people who have made this long, dangerous voyage and now they find themselves in Greece, this voyage has cost them thousands of euros or thousands of dollars. You know, they've, they've, they've pooled their resources. A family has sent one member or two members hoping that they will land safely, a safe haven somewhere in Europe. So they're doing a cost-benefit analysis. If you're in, it's an investment in their future. Why would you want to spend all this and then end up in a country where you may not be welcomed? There may be no opportunities for you. You you want to you you want to go where you can make the most of whatever it was, whatever it's been to, that's 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 cost you money to get there. So Germany and Sweden. Uh, in particular, uh, were two nations that we saw really shoulder the responsibility of long, the long-term consequences or effects of uh, asylum, because they are the ones, and, and other, I don't want to just say Germany and Sweden, other countries, obviously we're talking about many countries here, but they are responsible for the long-term hosting, uh, they are ultimately uh, responsible or hoping to see these arrivals integrate within their society. And so while this country shares or carries the burden of the new arrivals, that's temporary. If they move on, the long term the long term responsibility may very well rest with other other European Union nations. So yeah you can show that. So after leaving Greece, initially, um, what they were doing, you can see this is kind of gives you an idea of the route that they would take to Germany. And they would go through the, uh, the Balkans, the Western Balkans, or through the Balkans, and toward those more uh, welcoming and more financially solvent countries. But these countries eventually cut off their borders. You know, there are so many maps out there. You can look up all this information and see these maps. So they erected some their fences in place. They, they have reinstated uh, some of the border, certainly some of the border controls. Uh, and so it was an attempt to cut off the route to thwart this movement, which if you think about it, it it's not really a solution. Because now you've got this huge bottleneck of people who, who, who are kind of trapped in place. They're, they, they, they can no longer travel, or they can't travel the routes that they hope to travel. So the inability to process asylum application was only one reason why we saw Greece engaged in this wave through. There was, there's another reason, and it's something called the Dublin Regulation. The Dublin Regulation of 2003 stipulates that European Union 
asylum claims must be processed in the first country that the asylum seeker reaches. So this is something that all countries are supposed to abide by. If you're an asylum seeker, the very first country that you come into, that's the country that's supposed to process your application, unless you've got family elsewhere. You have family, let's say, in, in Austria. But they, they, make, they do make some exceptions. So why does the Dublin, the Dublin regulation, it's like, whoa, this doesn't really make a lot of sense because especially in this context, we, we already know there's no way Greece was going to be able to process these. But because of the Dublin regulation, that's what the European Union expected them to do and all the other countries as well. The Dublin regulation exists for two reasons. One is to prevent asylum shopping. Uh, so asylum seekers might fill out an application in more than one country, uh, you know, hedging their bets, so to speak. Well, maybe, I won't, maybe we won't receive asylum in Austria, but we may receive asylum in this country next door. Okay? So it was, to, it was designed to prevent that. But the other reason why the Dublin regulation was put in place was to prevent something called refugees in orbit. Okay, so when I first read this, refugees in orbit, I immediately envisioned people kind of floating around, orbiting, and that's kind of what they're doing. Refugees in orbit means because of this, this stipulation that they have to be processed in the country of first arrival, it erases all doubt. This process should take, you know, should be started immediately. There's no doubt. They're not going to be processed anywhere else. They're going to be processed wherever they first reached uh, land. Asylum, I, I, I wrote this, I said, this Dublin regulation assumes asylum laws and practices of the EU are based on common standards and all applications are fairly uh, examined. But in fact, asylum regulations and laws and practices vary widely. Um, it, it resulted in this disproportionate burden being placed, especially on this one country. Uh, but there were other countries as well. So what do we know? We know that way too many people were arriving there. We know that these, this country had a less than robust economic environment. And we also know that it had a very uncertain political situation. And so there were very poor reception conditions and no guarantee of pr procedure. I will say this. When we think about refugees around the world, it's not that uncommon for refugees to travel through a number of countries before finally arriving in their host country, that third, that safe country, so to speak. So I would talk to, I've talked to refugees in Uganda, I've talked to refugees in Lebanon, and they would tell me how circuitous their routes might have been when they fled their country. So they just simply passed through from one nation to the next until they arrived in Lebanon, or until they arrived in Jordan, or until they arrived in Uganda. In the European Union, that's not the way it's supposed to, to work. You don't just pass through. You, you can, but guess what? Your application is supposed to be processed in that first country in which you arrive. The other thing to keep in mind is that asylum does not, is not necessarily a first step towards citizenship. When you reach, if you receive asylum in the European Union, you're going to be granted, it's usually a period of three years, temporary residency. And, uh, and then it's going to be reviewed again thereafter. Only after, in some, in some countries it varies, but only after a number of years where you have achieved permanent res residency, might you be able to apply for citizenship. So it's, you know, it, it, it's different there. So because of the way through, the asylum seekers were applying for asylum in these countries where it clearly could not have been the first country they arrived in, unless of course they fell out of the air, or they were, they were refugees in orbit. So, uh, uh, the, and they knew that. Germany knew that. 
Germany waived the Dublin regulation for Syrian refugees. They said, we don't care where you came in. We'll, we'll process your applications. But these other countries were, were far less likely to do so. They wanted to know, where, from, where did you enter? Where did you come in? Because they're responsible for processing your application. And in some cases, the, the refugee or the migrant workers, because again, we still don't know what they are, they were forthcoming and they, they told them. Many, many times they were not forthcoming. They did not tell them where they first entered. So they didn't know where to send the application. So what did that do that created this backlog? That created this backlog. Well, to address the imbalance uh, of, and, and it was clear, there was a huge imbalance what the EU decided to do was they decided that they were going to relocate 160,000 um, refugee, re refugee and migrant worker applicants uh, applications and they were going to, using some kind of quota system, they were going to redistribute them to countries in the European Union. They said this is the only fair thing to do. They said it's going to take two years to do so. Uh, but not all the countries were really okay with this. Uh, I know that Hungary, Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia were pretty adamant. They didn't want to participate in this at all. We know that uh, the UK certainly did. They, they certainly opted out. Remember, the United Kingdom is part of the European Union, but they're not part of the Schengen. So they, they, they opted out. They said, no, we're not going to do it because, first of all, it should be voluntary if a country participates in this. And secondly, we think that if people back in, name your place, whatever home country we're talking about, if they see that this is, this process is being waived, this dubbing regulation is being waived, it's just going to encourage more to come. Um, so, uh, as of May 13th of this year, only 1,500 applicants and applications have been transferred out of the thousands, tens of thousands that they said that they would do. So they haven't been very successful. Uh, what's pretty obvious, it's a key finding, I think, is that people are, uh, most asylum seekers were self-relocating across the EU. They were, they were headed in very definite, for very definite countries. And once they, you know, once the member state uh, reached their decision, if it was positive, the asylum seeker was then recategorized as a refugee. This process can take, um, it depends on the country, the asylum application process can take five months, it can take seven months, it can take nine months. It just depends, it depends on the situation. Syrian refugee asylum applications are usually processed pretty quickly, uh, so it usually takes far less time to process them. But if you are a migrant worker, uh, and, or an economic migrant, and your asylum application clearly shows that you are from a country that is considered safe. There are no, should not be any refugee issues there. That asylum application is going to be processed really very quickly because they want you out. You know, they, they, they want you out. You're not going to get asylum. You're just not going to get asylum. About 52% of all asylum applications uh, are given a thumbs up. About 52% last year were given refugee status or some other kind of protection status. It's another status I won't get into. Uh, and if you, if they say you, if they do not approve your asylum status or they say that you know you you don't meet the definition of a refugee or someone in need of protection, you there is an appeal process. Uh, you have the right to appeal, but the odds of that being overturned are really slim. It's only about 14% of those who uh, appeal their asylum uh, you know, rejection, so to speak, will have that overturned. And then, after, and then if it's still, if they're, if they're reject, if, if again they're turned down at that point, they're given a period of time to uh, to leave. They the the expectation. There's a lot of information out there, and I'm not going to go into all of to, to it by any stretch, but they're given a period of time to voluntarily go back home. Um, Sometimes, you know, there, is, there are deportations that are ongoing. Um, uh, Germany, 
I saw Germany is pretty interesting. Germany has decided they're going to try and pay people to go back home who don't meet the definition of someone in need of international protection. So they will uh, typically give them some money. They will they will fly them back to wherever you know wherever wherever it might be. And I've also read that they sometimes give grants to um, men and women who want to start a small business uh, home. And I've seen those grants as much as like the equivalent of six thousand dollars. So that's you know that's pretty interesting. Uh, I was reading somewhere, kind of unrelated to this, that every year the European Union uh, requests four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand uh, foreign nationals to re to go back home. That they you know they've they've either overstayed a visa or they're there illegally. It's not related necessarily to issues of asylum, but just in general. Um, and so uh, I think um, I, in, in terms of asylum applications in 2016, according to Eurostat, uh, in the first quarter of 2016, there were 287,000 uh, first-time asylum applications filed, down 33% from the fourth quarter of 2015. So there has been a decline in the number of asylum seekers. Part of that is, is the, a lot of that is due to the European Union's uh, agreement with Turkey. Um, so they're being processed differently. But I did see, I did see uh, yesterday or the day before that um, some organization, I don't remember which one it was, suggests that this year over 300,000 uh, African uh, migrants could arrive uh, in Italy, uh, from uh, Libya, for example. So, you know, this is certainly going to be an ongoing, an ongoing issue for them to deal with. And so, uh, I just want, you know, I just wanted to end by saying, you know, if this is a crisis, there's no exit from that crisis other than the solidarity of humans. Um, you know, whether we consider it a crisis or not, how, are we going to try and manage this crisis or are we going to try and solve what's causing this crisis? Because what we're seeing here in Europe is the end result of something that's happening in, in a, you know, other parts of the world. And that's what we, that, that needs to be resolved. Those issues need to be resolved or this is just going, this will continue, this will continue. You know, when we look at Syria, what, it's been five years and uh, we have it's suggested that there are five million Syrian refugees. More than half the population has been displaced. <coughs> so, anyway. So, uh, I guess that's all I have for you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, did you say that um, approximately 8% of the European uh, refugees are from Iraq? Yes. Oh, like 8%? I, it was 8%. 20% mm -hmm. were Afghans and more than half were from Syria. And, and um, how come the Afghans, I don't, I don't think you uh, addressed that. I come, didn't. How come they're having problems? Well, the Afghans are no longer, uh, they no longer meet the definition of someone who is in need of protection. It's, that again is very controversial because we know that conditions change. When we think, when I think of Afghanistan, I think, Wow, is that a country that's safe or not? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to be living there. But they are not, more than likely, they are not going to receive asylum because that is now considered a country where things are getting under control and they just won't receive asylum. I, I, re I just want to say one more thing. I remember when my son was, was there in Lesbos, and again, we had a lot of discussions about this, and he said, you know, the, the Afghans were well aware that their, their odds of seeking, as, of receiving asylum were going to be slim to none, but that did not stop them. Are they considered economic refugees? Oh, that's a good question. I suppose that you, uh, I, 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 I mean, if they're, if they're refugees, they're refugees. Well, they're if, leaving Afghanistan seeking a better life, not... But that would be an that would be a, an economic migrant. Okay. It wouldn't be a refugee. They don't they don't meet the definition of refugee status. Okay. And that is something. Again, the more you you 
you learn about this, and the more you read about this, you think, this is crazy. You know, this doesn't make any sense. Why, does, why would they not continue to receive protection? Yeah. I don't have any answers to that. One other clarification. You said 52% of the European refugees were granted asylum? Yes. Of the yeah. asylum seekers, they did receive asylum, yes. 52%. And one thing that I didn't say was, uh, and I didn't bring those figures in, these are available, and I, if anyone's interested, I could give them the, the data, but uh, that varied widely from European country to European country. So for example, let's say you were, um, let's say you were from, uh, so, uh, oh, I don't know, I'm trying, my, my mind's just gone right now, but you were Somali and you were seeking uh, asylum in, let's say, Austria, for example, or, or something like that, uh, or someplace like that, you, it, Austria might have granted asylum to 70% of Somali applicants, it, it, and so that was, that was good for them. But if they applied for asylum, a, a Somali uh, refugees uh, or asylum seekers, let's say, maybe they applied for asylum in, uh, Cyprus, for example, they might have they might have had a rejection rate of seventy percent. So it just it just it just depended. And they and the, and the asylum seekers know this. They know, uh, I think, where their odds are better. Thank you. Yeah. Why are their odds better in certain places like Germany? What is Germany's motivation for um, taking on more asylum seekers? Well, that's a question of history, if I may I'd be so sure. bold. Uh, if you are a student of history and you look at what the Germans have allowed themselves, uh, especially, of course, in pre-World War II and then during World War II, and the immense guilt levied upon themselves, and they, of course, did it to themselves, then you know also why Angela Merkel at some point in time had to admit that cultural integration has failed. So why is the German so particularly curious to show to the world that they can do better, finally can do better, is because they're absorbing all these masses of people who really don't fit in their cultural realms and that can pose, in the other direction, of course, a tremendous problem. And we've seen it, of course, in small entities in that Brexit experience, you know, with the English people. I don't know whether I answered your question, because it is a complex uh, uh, issue, which is very difficult to address. Yeah, it is, and I don't, I don't know that I have an answer to that either. I think it's really interesting, uh, and and I have, I actually have, have read that argument, you know, posited elsewhere. So I think that it's really interesting that you have a country like Germany, uh, who, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty darn big land mass, and they have a, I, I don't even know off the top of my head what their population is, but it's amazing that they. Uh, took in so many, accepted so many applications. About 88 million. So, uh, you know, the proportions are immense. If you are walking, and of course everybody probably heard by now that I must be German, uh, <laughs> if you go uh, through your hometown and uh, you look around and uh, you sit down and you don't even hear any longer your own language, the people look different, then that might kind of sound nationalistic, even uh, kind of tamed it toward racism. But that's a fact. Go and travel and see what's happening there. There's an enormous, enormous responsibility of what the German population and government, of course, has taken upon themselves. Yeah, and I've heard, I've also heard, uh, I've heard that said from people in England, uh, you know, you hear the same, 
same kind of comment that if you go to, if you find yourself in a park or a public place or whatever, that you don't hear English, you hear different languages. And that, of course, we know, as I said, immigration was a big issue, probably be, was the issue, even though I think they're trying to say it's not, but I think it was the issue that led to them uh, voting to leave the, UK, the EU. So, yeah. Mr. Bushface, is there any research, big research being generated concerning the impacts of all these things you're talking about? For example, there's, there's some, I think there's some data indicating that young migrants generally have pretty powerful positive economic impacts on countries that they come into mm -hmm. very often. And of course, they're, even though they have positive economic impacts, it means some people in the country will be displaced to mm -hmm. some extent, especially older people, so there could be anger. But this whole question of cultural mix and all the rest of it seems to transcend international borders to a great extent of sure. what we live in today. So I wondered if there's some research being generated about yes. Well, I have no doubt about that. Yes. That's, that's, that goes with, yeah. I know that's been going on, David. And, 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 and the other thing about, uh, I will say this as well, because I didn't talk about demographics at all, but uh, I believe 66% of the uh, asylum seekers, uh, it's uh, male, have been male. 66% have been male. And uh, uh, there's been a, a lot of unaccompanied uh, minors who have also been part of this mixed flow as well. And uh, of, you know, maybe 16 to 17 years of age, and I was reading Sweden has been a country, Sweden took in, uh, they've accepted 160,000 last, last year alone, and now they have put, put on the brake, so to speak. But they, the demographers in that country are uh, looking ahead because when you add these, this influx of 16 to 17 year old males that are non-Swedish, if you add those to the 16 to 17 year old <coughs> males that are Swedish, and then you take the unaccompanied females that entered Sweden, 16 to 17 years of age, and you add them to the Swedish females of the same age, there's now a gender imbalance that's uh, 123 males for every 100 females. That's, that's, that's significant, you know, going forward, because I think isn't the natural uh, variation, isn't it like 105 to 100? More female than male, I think. Mean. Oh, it's more female than male. Yeah, if you talk to Sam, like, it goes on a few more female than male um, and for a good demographic balance. Yeah, so this is a much higher imbalance than yeah. even what we have seen. Yeah, because of the negative uh, race, female male ratios you find in China and India right now. Yeah. Infanticide and, and sex selection. And it's needed a social problem to have that, that sex healthy mark imbalance. So that's bad for Sweden. If they have yeah, to it's bad going forward. And if they are married, if they're 16 and 17 year old ma males who are married in their countries, they're not going to be they're not going to be given any special consideration to bring their wives over because Europe doesn't recognize the marriages of of, of minors. So. You know, that's that's just I, as I said, you you, you could talk about this forever and a lot of different you know, a lot of different issues that you just don't have time. Yeah. I have to go to England fairly frequently. In the over the past five years the demographics in London especially have changed immensely. Immensely. I mean it shocks me every time that I see it. Uh -huh. How the changes have happened. Secondly, just a question. Why can't other Middle East countries be asked, forced, cajoled, whatever to get more involved in this? Well, it's the Gulf state countries that don't take, um, I believe it's the Gulf state countries that do not accept uh, the refugees. So uh, the countries, countries like Jordan, they have, you know, they, they, they are no longer even accepting any more Syrian refugees. We know Lebanon, you know, they, here's a country that's, we know, we know countries have done it, but there are many that have not, and I don't know the answer to that. I do not know the answer to that. That is.
That is something that is perplexing, and maybe someone else here knows the answer to that. William, do you? I'm going to put William on the spot. Well, I know that uh, a number of those countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, have declined to involve themselves in, in finding a political solution to the Syrian conflict, and as part of that process have declined to accept Syrian refugees mm -hmm. in their countries because they see them as a destabilizing factor. Right. Mm -hmm. That's probably it. So geopolitics or yeah, regional nice. geopolitics play a large part in how Middle Eastern countries have not played a part in trying to solve the conflict in Syria. It certainly applies where Palestinians are concerned. Of course. You know, the Palestinian refugee they've been, crisis they've been has been ongoing for decades. They've been pawns in a great game right. and forced into a horrible, horrible, horrible situation. Mm -hmm. So the 1951 document that is not being followed by them, even though they were not being participate. The 1951 Refugee Convention, what about it? It's part of the EU, EU I understand, you know, but it sounds like these countries are not participating in that agreement. You were saying earlier, even, even though you don't sign it, you expect it to comply with the agreement. Exactly, but I, I'm, I have every bit of confidence in thinking that they have all signed it. They have all signed it. But there are, there are countries in the world that have not signed it. You know, it's just like any other... Uh, international, you know, treaty, or not all countries are signatories to that treaty, and so they they may or may not uh, feel like they are, are are bound to agree with the you know the, the, the tenet of the treaty. But no, they, even though all those rights that I read off uh, are not necessarily being followed in some instances. You know, it, when we look at the countries of the European Union, uh, and you can't see them all here on this particular map, uh, it's possible that there will be instances of... What, what is your sense of the prognosis? Do you feel that it's going to become more, just from your experience, from what you've been researching, is it likely to become more chaotic, or do you feel that the, human, the, that's the human, humanism of it will motivate people to, to grasp these terrible kinds of consequences you've been describing and trying to redress them or people just abandoning concern about it in these countries? That, David, that's a really difficult no, question. I'm just to what, answer. Is your, what, your gut, what does your gut tell you from the, because you've immersed yourself in this, I'm just really wondering what your feeling is. Well, my gut tells me that, I, I have a couple comments. I, uh, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of feelings about, obviously, what takes place in Europe, and they, they're grappling with a lot, and, and they're, it seems like they should be capable of, of, of addressing this issue and doing it better, maybe better than what they have. You know, I don't want to criticize them, I'm just saying these are some of the issues that, that they've confronted. But in terms of, is this a situation or is this a problem that's going to cease to exist, uh, no. I don't think so. I, I, I think that there will be, there's been, look at the, con, you know, we could talk about conflicts till we all die. Oh, I shouldn't say that. But we, we, we could talk about conflicts forever, and uh, now, I think it will continue. Of, isn't it a question of politics? Well, yeah. If we are, we, we don't need to avoid that particular subject. If we are able to find ourselves finally some sound leadership, uh, you know, and I don't want to touch certain sensitive issues there in our country here mm -hmm. and over there too. Mm -hmm. uh, because we see very soon, you know, what Brexit is going to bring. It will push EU to look at their policies much closer than mm -hmm. they did in the past. Mm -hmm. Because as you very clearly said to us, Every different country of these 28 members mm -hmm. have, in a sense, different policies mm -hmm. and are very egotistical to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's all then basically a question of money. I compliment you for your final statement. And I think this gentleman made the point, and you, uh, the humanitarian aspects of mm -hmm. it what your heart and gut is going to tell you how to mm -hmm. treat others mm -hmm. should be uh, bringing this whole situation 
uh, you know, to a final point, to a solution. In my lifetime, and I was born over there, uh -huh. I have seen this whole periphery of problems unfolding one way from year to year in a different manner. And I'm going to tell you, I am a very strong globalist. If we are not pursuing, you know, a, a Eurostatic direction, then we are lost just as much as we, if we don't understand here in this country that we have to work together rather than being divisive. This whole situation you were trying to explain to us as a topic is not going to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. But that's the ongoing issue. Yes? I mean, those are wonderful words, but how do you, that's an issue as old as, as the mountains. Of course how it is. Do, how do you change? I mean, you, you can say that, but how do you move into a solution? I mean, well, everybody will not, that's correct, but how do you move off of that? Well, you start, first of all, what uh, uh, we heard, educate our young people and evoke interest <coughs> and learning how, what the problems are, and then go in a direction of how they could be solved. But then on the other hand, we, the older ones, who have lived this life to a large degree and seen it, we need to help select the right leadership in order to get us to these points. We are not doing it. Over and over and over again, we are not doing it. Do you think, Linda, that you know, when you say that we should make a political issue, if I switch that and think of it as an economic issue, it's probably not the way to word the question, but do you think countries like the European Union and the United States that we should feel guilty when you look at global inequality economically, and we think of it as an economic issue, these people are fleeing and wars exist for very economic reasons. Mm -hmm. Given your work, should we feel guilty? Like I said, that may not be the way to, to word it, but maybe that opens up solutions. <laughs> Of course we should. You can pass. <laughs> yeah. Does that make it more an economic issue than a political issue? And I realize that yeah, those two cannot be separate. They go I, hand in hand. I think that when you, I think that one of the, you know, one of the greatest lessons that I've learned just by, it, it goes beyond, you know, reading and, and learning and educating myself. I think the greatest lesson that I've learned uh, when I find myself among refugees, what you know, regardless of wherever they are, it's just the. Uh, I it's so complex. It's hard for me to even put it in words. Uh, that I'm really, I'm really thankful for what I have. I'm. It's very sobering when I see how little so many other people have and and it's and it's puzzling to me it's puzzling to me it's it's I, I think about these issues a lot why is it this way what can we do how can we address this why does it continue to happen what can I do as an individual if anything at all to to just bring shed some light on this subject um, it's been, I, I think, just every time I go uh, somewhere like this, whether it's in Lebanon or whether it's in the, on the, in the West Bank or whether it's Jordan or wherever it is, um, it's, it's really sobering and uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, I think, it, I guess it sounds kind of goofy, but I think it's changed my life. You know, I, it's changed my life in a lot of different ways. So I look at things differently. And so when I come back to the United States of America, I'm, it's really hard for me to, to, to come back because it's like we are such a, we are a land of plenty. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we have so much and so, so many people have nothing. Well, yeah, I, I think I, the way you phrase it is really key. I don't know, this is just my, my, I'm just, for the last few years, I've just been kind of overwhelmed by the sense that the chaos has grown. 
and that people think that it's not going to affect them, but it's going to affect all of us. I think what you're doing is really useful. I think just, just this kind of presentation, just documenting and letting people know, this is like you, you're sitting in your nice, comfortable little house and all the rest of it, and you feel that things that happen abroad and other places don't affect you, but this is a cancer. This is thing that's going to engulf you. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you know, pay attention. You're not, you're not going to be able just to, mm-hmm. to hold your nose and say it's too bad it's happening to them. So, guilt is useful. It stimulate. It should stimulate some fear. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think what you're doing is, is really Thank useful. You, and very if I can extend that just a just a minute, say here, you have a city, eleventh largest city in the U.S. Austin is the eleventh largest city in the U.S., which is huge. And uh, it's a very wealthy city. And yet, if you extract from this room the students that were told to come here or encouraged to come here, and folks that really came here because they saw it, saw the ad in the paper, I mean, that should give you some gauge of awareness versus true feeling to do something versus grappling with the issue. I'm mm-hmm. not making myself clear. Mm-hmm. But really, I mean, you can count people on one hand. Well, that's very good. Yeah, right. right. So, I mean, Sorry to tell something. you that. Sir? That, that is America. Right, right. Uh, and again, I certainly don't want to be impolite to say that, uh, you know, 50% of this population is dominated by such extreme uh, ignorance. And lack it's of not education. Impolite, that's fact. Okay. <laughs> so that what what do we expect? And we talked about poverty a little bit ago. My God, guys, I mean poverty. Go to East Austin. Go down south to the border. I mean, hello. What what are we facing here? Mm-hmm. When we are trying to build a huge wall to accomplish what? I mean, the attitude. We first of all have to fix ourselves, our attitude towards people, and look at our constitution. What that constitution, for instance, has said to us, how we should conduct ourselves to each other. Well, that that would be a start, but somebody, again, I come back to my word leadership, somebody is going to find themselves a leader who is going to penetrate our thick skulls so that we are more and more and more understand what, you know, internationalism means. Mm-hmm. You know, that exceptionalism, what we are preaching, is a bunch of nonsense. Oh, oh I'm getting really... <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Did you have a comment? I had a question, actually. Um, what was... Um, unlike the European Union countries, some countries don't have to follow the rules, but what are the, like you said, some countries were building fences. What were their reasoning or their justification in doing so? To keep them out. Of, well, spe- especially officially, what were the declarations that were like such? Well, I think, for example, Hungary, for example, that has been building or has erected a fence, it may be temporary, uh, they, they simply didn't <coughs> want any more within the confines of their country. But I think that, for example, Macedonia, those people were not going to stay in Macedonia. They were going to flow through. And I think these countries were experiencing pressure from other European Union countries to stop the flow and stop the flow at all costs. So you build the fence. We've seen, you know, you get online. You can see all the the, the pictures of the... Of the, of the razor wire and the fences and the, the men with their, with their weapons and keep them, keep them out, which is not, that's not the solution. And those countries are not part of the Schengen then? So well, some of, well, some of them are, but, but they're, Schengen countries can temporarily reinstate border controls. It's, and, and I, I, I think I read that Croatia. perhaps eight had done so. I don't know if that's still true Croatia's today. Been, uh, I mean, is Croatia in the Schengen? No. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, well, they've yeah. done that. They've uh, done just what you described. And They're area concerned is about well. the Albanians bringing a lot of drug, yeah, drug-related drug crime into the country, and they're trying to stem the flow of immigration. They don't want to stop it altogether, but they've done just what you said. 
And, and see, Europe doesn't have the history of the refugee camps, the refugee camps that we see in other parts of the world, where we see camps in uh, different African countries or camps in Asian countries. They don't, they don't do that. I think Sicily has some camps, but now what we have in Greece is we have these detention centers, and they're, they're, they're like camps. They're, they're, they're being held really, you know, it's almost, I want to say, against their will. <coughs> they don't have any freedom of movement. They're, they're being detained. And that's what we were seeing. I think there were like 50,000 minimally. Yes, sorry. Um, what is Israel's level of support for like, refugees? I mean, Within their own nation? Or just in, like, in their neighborhood? Um, I'm going to say no. They, they don't. They don't. What was the question? En encourage, they don't encourage re refugees within their own nation. It's not to say that there aren't refugees in Israel. There are. I've met refugees who, who were refugees in Israel, but but left. They left after a period of time. So I don't know that Israel. Play, I don't know what role Israel is playing in this particular situation. They may be. None at all. They may be, you know, just, it doesn't involve them. But I, I hate, to, I don't want to say it like that. So it's hands off. I, and that's my guess. So, yeah. Um, I read something that, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, right, since the Brexit vote, there has been an increase in hate crimes on refugees and just they were coming to England. Uh, if that's the case, could it be a cause for concern for? Them migrating to other countries, i.e., the U.S. or going to Asia or anything like that. Well, I know that the country that's received more asylum applications than any other country is Germany, and that's followed by the United States. Um, but uh, I, I don't know about the increase in the hate crimes. But what's interesting about the U.K. is this whole this Brexit vote. If it was uh, passed because of this issue of immigration, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the UK, they're not members of the uh, Schengen. So if, you, if you're going, so if, some of you I know have heard of Calais. So Calais is in France, and it's just on this side of the, um, oh gosh, what is it, the channel? Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Yes. So that's where, that's where uh, um, their customs or their border control is. Mm -hmm. And so these, these, Refugees and asylum seekers are being held up there at Calais. They can't they can't get across the English Channel, so they're they're trying to get on the back of lorries or or usually that's the way they they, they will travel. But um, the UK only accepted thirty eight thousand applications from asylum seekers last year. 38,000, and yet the figures that I've seen in the last week was that in 2015, the UK had a net migration, net migration in 2015 of 333,000. Some of you have probably seen that figure. Well, 333,000, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I know that they're not, they didn't get a lot of asylum applications relative to some of these other countries, so where were these, where were, where is this migration coming from? It's coming from other European Union countries, mostly from those Eastern European countries and also non-European countries. And that's what they really want to stop. When, when those Eastern European countries, are we finished playing? When those Eastern European countries joined uh, the European Union, there was a lot of alarm by the Western European nations that were already members of the European Union because they felt pretty sure, or they were worried, that there'd be a huge migratory movement from the Eastern countries into their countries where the standard of living is higher, the opportunities are greater, uh, the cost, you know, on and on and on. Uh, and so, that, you know, that's, that's been an issue. That's kind of been an ongoing issue. So when the UK talks about immigration issues, they're talking about immigration not from asylum seekers. They're talking about, uh, and yet that's, that's the way it was presented. 
If you look at those posters, those posters that, Ni what was his name, Nigel Farage was standing in front of him, those posters showed refugees in, I don't even remember what country, uh, and it had nothing to do with people trying to get into the UK. And that's just, it's, well, spear -mongery. That's what I, 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 I want to center. Right. And it was successful, I guess, if you're on the Brexit side. And we don't want to forget that the ugly head of the right-wing extremist groups is sticking their heads up mm -hmm. uh, in any of these countries. You mentioned Hungary or Hungary. Uh, right-wing government, <coughs> Poland turned just right-wing. Mm -hmm. All these elements, Germany, I mean, there are still plenty of the skinheads and neo-Nazis or whatever you might call them. Mm -hmm. All these influences are coming to bear. Mm -hmm. And when I said something earlier about the individual core members, if they are not addressing the political situation, uh, mm -hmm. then they are whistling Dixie, as they say down here in the South, about their economic problems. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. The document, uh, the 1951 document, you said it outlined the obligations of these nations towards refugees. Is there a similar document or a section of the same document that outlines the obligations of refugees towards these uh, countries? Well, they certainly have responsibilities and obligations when they are being hosted in these other nations. Uh, as far as a document that exists, I am not aware of a document like that. So it's more local, maybe? Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and when we think about you know, who wields the most power in these situations, we might think that it's the UNHCR that holds the most power in a refugee situation. But in reality, it's the host nation. It's the host nation. That, and they, 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 they are the ones that have the mindset. Aren't the refugees say. subject to the laws of the country they're in? Yes. I'm sorry? Aren't the refugees sure. subject to the laws mm -hmm. of the country? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can lose their refugee status if they engage in a you know, particular type of crime. So. Yeah. Do they get like, debriefed on Debriefed what? on what the laws yeah. of the... <laughs> I, mean, um, I understand, obviously, in Greece they wouldn't because they wouldn't take it to handle it, but let's say more established countries like Germany. I, the I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm assuming that when they fill out that application and if their application is approved, they're going to get plenty of directives at that point. And, and, and that's what I'm guessing, especially because this takes a long time for their application to be either you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. So yeah, I would, I would think that that's true. But that's fair. Yeah, people in a country don't know their own damn rules, so. <laughs> you know, we're that is not an excuse. We're at, man, but we're asking a question that's not really like a realistic question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have legal immigrants that have to pass a test that most high schoolers can't pass, let alone people who graduated from college about tech, about the U.S. history. So. Um, yeah, I mean, people are going to assimilate, and that's what the issue is, assimilation or not assimilation. But, but they never use the word assimilation, they always use the word integration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the German Prime Minister said it failed, right? The integration. The integration failed, okay. The cultural integration. What's the difference between... I, I can't address that because I didn't, I don't know that, I don't, I'm not familiar with what she said. What's the nuance between those two words? Is it well, well if you assimilate, the expectation is you are giving up whatever cultural aspects that you have known and you've lived by, and you are becoming one with in this new country. I always I tell students it's like this. It looks um, it's as if you would say a plus b plus c equals a, a being the the, the, the group, the majority group, to, that you are expected to assimilate to, B and C being the minority groups, A plus B plus C equals A. So at the end, you're supposed to look like A, act like A, think like A, but in reality, A has changed. 
And to integrate is different. It's like a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus c. You know, you integrate, but you don't give up your complete cultural identity. And, and you can balance those. You can balance those. There are no more Turks living in any other country other than in Turkey than in Germany. And they all, and I preface that this is relative, of course, have tried to integrate themselves. But this is what Merkel said. It failed from a standpoint of the willingness, and it has something to do also with religion, of course, you know, that they were able to give up to the traditions, you know, which they were used to coming over there. And that went not only into the first or second generations, now is the third generation. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very uh, mm -hmm. intricate subject matter, you know, which we have to be very careful, you know, mm -hmm. by looking at it. America is a different cup of tea when yes. we're looking at all these, these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. There are, of course, certain similarities, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, mm -hmm. the EU uh, will have a real stand to make. And of course, in the last several days when they had their meeting, you know, they discussed mm -hmm. it. Well, you can't belong in a place where you're not accepted. If you're not accepted, how do you have a sense of belonging? Black lives right. matter. Huh? Black lives matter. Mm -hmm. We know that from our own experience here. It's tough. Yeah. So did the innovation fail before the refugees arrived, or is it just something that happened now? Before well, I... Uh, are you, are you speaking in regards to Merkel in about, Germany? Yeah, you were talking about like the Turkish population. I understand the third generation are more German than their Turkish now? Oh, yes. Okay, oh, yes. so the irrigation was partly successful until the... To a large degree successful, but there are still oh, the same still. elements there, which of course feed now in our present situation with that huge onslaught of... I mean, we used to say in German, the guest workers. You know, uh, you know, all these people coming into our country, rebuilding Germany. We are using this example, you know. This, and then they pushed them uh, You know, and, and uh, as I said earlier, the, the religious aspect of it is a very profound and difficult problem to solve in all of these countries, particularly in France. And that's almost a paradox. And there are a lot of studies out there uh, that certainly have been done in many of these countries that address these issues of integration and you know children of immigrants and children of refugees and 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 you can you know you can certainly research that. So, any other questions? It's a good work. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Thank you for. Uh, preparation for this. <laughs> so thank you again. Yeah. Is this a series of talks or other, other talks? Together? Yes, this is a series where we'll have uh, uh, two events per semester. And we have uh, our second summer semester event will take place uh, July 29th. 27th. 27th. Me, sorry, today's the 29th. Uh, no, it'll actually be at the Riverside campus, and the topic for the next event is human trafficking in South Asia. Do you have a list of dates for this? Uh, we will be coming out with a list of dates. We're working on lining that up for the for the next academic year. Thank you. You're welcome. Did William, how does it get into the Chronicle and the Statesman?